Well, hello, welcome. My name's Athena Jackson. I am the Director of Library Special Collections, and I'm very glad to be your MC today. I wanna to open this event by recognizing that as a public and land-grant institution, it is important to acknowledge that our campus resides on the homeland of the Gabrielino Tongva people, the traditional land caretakers of where many of us are situated today, even at home. Welcome to the Library Special Collections and the Charles Young Research Library on Zoom. Thank you so much for being here today. I know a lot of you have been library supporters and your investment in our goals continues to make a positive impact on how we're able to do our work effectively and creatively every day. The Library Special Collections is part of the library that supports research and engagement with our rarest and most unique materials through the collections we build and the connections we foster with many communities. From rare manuscripts and books to emails of prominent figures in our collections, we provide a wide array of research opportunities supporting the entirety of the academic disciplines across UCLA. Now that's a lot of scope. So we count on our expert curatorial teams and their connections with peers and faculty to make collecting, collecting dishes, decisions daily. And we work from strategically designed collection development priorities that we update regularly to ensure our holdings and our goals match well to the ever evolving research and learning enterprise here at UCLA. One area that I'm especially excited about is our university archives. The archives are so connected to the achievements, the challenges and the experiences of the UCLA. They tie our students to our alumni, our faculty to their predecessors and our community partners to our endeavors. In fact, I imagine any of, many of you in, here today are either alumni or UCLA enthusiasts like me. So I know I'm in good company when I say that collecting our institutional memory is critical and to telling the whole story of our place to LA and our history of our global impact to the world. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Heather Briston, our university archivist and our head of curators and collections for library special collections. Heather brings an enthusiasm to her role and breadth of knowledge that you will sense immediately. So without further ado, take it away, Heather, and go Bruins. Thank you, Athena, for that lovely introduction. Well, this afternoon, I hope I can show all of you, especially some of you who have lots of history with UCLA, some things that are new to you, and most of all, pique your curiosity to explore and learn more. So one thing that you may have heard from Athena is, is about our larger history and how we tell the story. So Uni University Archives is a part of the UCLA Library Special Collections, which of course is part of the UCLA Library. And together we endeavor to preserve and make available the unique, rare and important materials in a whole host of formats and ranging from the ancient to actually earlier today. I preserved an email that I received from the executive vice chancellor uh, message earlier today. So we are archiving even during the pandemic. Now, if you were, if we were in the Young Research Library, this is where I would be meeting all of you. And it's here where we bring the elements of the past into awareness for the present inquiry and research by our campus community and our local and regional communities. We focus on undergraduate and graduate learning and research as part of the vital role of the library in student and faculty success. But most of all, we are grounded in our public mission. We are open to inquiring minds from across the globe, even in this very disparate setting we currently find ourselves in. Today, I'm going to take us on a bit of a trip 
looking at this university through three lenses. First, the sphere of the campus and the administration. Secondly, the sphere of the faculty and the staff. And finally, the reason why we are all here, the students and the alumni. First off, most of you probably know that UCLA wasn't always in Westwood. We had a sort of a peripatetic uh, journey across downtown LA, finally finding ourselves in Westwood in 1929. We have a history of always outgrowing our, ourselves and our locations. So in 1924, the Regents appointed a committee that, when you think about it, did a fairly quick turnaround. In 1925, they had fielded over 100 proposed locations and narrowed it down to a small number of potentials. I have a collection in the archives that documents all of this, and there are literally many of stories that I'm sure you've all heard about the, the most famous story, which I like to call the Goldilocks and the Three Bears of UCLA, which is the, uh, the Pasadena location was too hot. And the Paso Robles location was too cold. And Westwood was just right. But how many of you know what I'm showing you here? That one of the opportunities that we let go was the opportunity to be UC Chino Hills. So I hope I, hope I have a few people out there who are listening to this from Chino Hills. And, and I want you all to try at your home the eight clap. And instead of UC, UCLA, it'd have to be UC Chino Hills. So you'd have to do it really fast. But yes, believe it or not, that's where we might have been. Another aspect about our campus and about um, the administration of our campus that you might not know is that the University Archives is known as the home for the official records of the university. And I have to tell you that it doesn't get much more official than the chancellor's records. I can pretty much rely on the fact that if I'm looking for an answer for a question, at some point the question has gone across the chancellor's desk. And so one day I was looking, I was looking for something else. I was doing research on a different question and I was looking in the chancellor files for December, 1959. So, uh, so well over, um, 60 years ago. And one of the things that I found, it was one of those marvelous opportunities that every archivist loves to have, where we find the thing that nobody knew we had. And that happened to be an original Ralph Bunch letter, which you can see reproduced on uh, the left-hand side of your screen. And uh, he wrote to us, as you can see, as part of his work in the United Nations. And he was writing to uh, Chancellor Knudsen at the time and congratulating us on uh, our vision and leadership in establishing one of the earliest African studies centers and which actually soon after its establishment went on to receive some of the prestigious federal recognition as an exemplar in the nation for African studies. And so that was, that was a very exciting day for me. And frankly, it's a very exciting day for the university to have a letter like that. Now, I'm sure that many of you know the storied history of our university and its connections to Hollywood and the entertainment industry. I mean, uh, some of our faculty have been involved, our students, they film on our campus. It's, it's a part of our lifeblood. Bob Hope emceed homecoming once. Elizabeth Taylor, uh, 
crowned the uh, homecoming king and queen. So um, we've had it all. And many of you might be like me and enjoy films and be a bit of a film buff. And so you also know that the director, Alfred Hitchcock, had a penchant for uh, having cameos in all of his films. And um, that is the same for the University Archives. Here you can see Alfred Hitchcock in a first anniversary photograph of the very well-known and internationally renowned Jules Stein Eye Institute in 1967. And here we have Mr. Hitchcock, and I'll have you note, he appears in only one photograph in this series and in this collection. And uh, standing there with him is the founding director, Dr. Strotzma, along with Jules Stein himself. Another hugely important area uh, for, our, uh, for UCLA is, of course, our faculty and our staff. Our faculty and users love the library. We collaborate with our faculty on supporting new areas of teaching and research all of the time. As their, as their curiosity grows, so does our work with them. And, and uh, as a testament to that, we have here Richard C. Rudolph. He was our first professor of Chinese and Asian studies, uh, in, uh, which opened in 1947. And so he started that program in 1947. And in October of 1948 through June of 1949, he spent a Fulbright traveling throughout China. And in this case, buying books to send to the library to build a collection so that he would, he and his students would have Chinese materials to teach and do research from. However, for those of you who know your dates and your history, you know that during that time, he was keeping one step ahead of the fighting between the communist and the national party armies in China. During this time, he purchased over 10,000 books, all of which he sent back to Westwood and all of which arrived safely. One of the things that I talk about with uh, students and that I talk about when I am uh, working with faculty in helping them understand how they can use university archives in their teaching, one of the things I like to highlight is my vision for university archives, which is everyone should be able to see themselves in the archives whether that is a representation literally of themselves in a yearbook or uh, other materials, or it's something that, we, uh, that people can see that they can aspire to. One of the areas that we have focused some of our collecting on in the past has been women in science. And one of the collections that we have is from, the, is from Professor Nina Byers. In 1961, she was the first and only female physics professor at UCLA, and she was the only physics prof female prof physics professor here for over 20 years. And during that time, she also concurrently held a position as the only female physics lecturer at Oxford. Her experience as a female physicist was central to her commitment to increase the representation of women in the sciences, particularly physics. And what I have uh, brought for us today is actually from her collection, and um, and it's 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 fascinating to look at because this is actually and think about this. This is from a job offer that she got at Washington before 
she was offered the job at UCLA. And at the University of Washington at that time, uh, they had a loyalty oath. And Professor Nina Byers, you, you, can't, you probably can't read this as well, but she took a stand and she refused to take their loyalty oath and she turned down a position. So think about that. A woman in physics turning down a tenured faculty position in order to take a stand for civil, li for civil liberties. It's, it's, it's a very inspirational collection to see. Another thing that um, we do quite a lot in library special collections is working with our faculty in uh, encouraging them to teach with our breadth of materials that you heard um, my director, Athena, talking about. And part of this is to help everyone develop the skills of critical review and synthesis of information. And we use these examples in all sorts of teaching, uh, teaching sessions. Our whole point is to uh, not only bring the material and the people who created them alive, but also model for students and have them model what active learning looks like. One of the collections that is my favorite to bring out for classes, and this is whether it's a science class or not, is the collection of Professor Paul Boyer, who uh, received the 1997 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And he was also the founding director of the Molecular Biology Institute. And what you, what you might be able to see, but probably aren't able to read on this, is the heavy annotating that he did of all of the articles that he would get copies of from the library. And, um, and what is interesting about this is that sometimes, and we've all done this, where we make notes about things that are important, but he literally would interrogate an article. And so to be able to show this to students, to see his notes about, possibly check this. This is an interesting point. And then he in, uh, writes these little notes like, can this do this? Does this make sense? And he makes all of these points. And then I'm able to show him writing correspondence to the author of the articles, asking them these questions. And in some cases, these become folders full of correspondence between scientists and researchers, and not just well-known people, but early career researchers and people from different disciplines other than his own. He voraciously consumed his research, and I love to be able to show that to students as an example of something that we can all do. Our students and alumni, and our students that, uh, and most especially our students, is the reason why we're all here. And our goal is to hope that they all become alumni. But, and this is my, also my opportunity to help you all see that while we are very serious about our educational endeavors and the research and the teaching and the forming of citizens that we can do here at UCLA, we also know how to have fun. And one of those ways that we have had fun for decades is through card stunts. Now, unfortunately, we do not do card stunts the way we used to do them, but you can see here, and I'm hoping maybe in all of you who are listening to this, I might have a few former UCLA rally committee members. If so, I'm so happy to have you on this seminar because this is by far 
uh, it's often talked of as one of our favorite collections because uh, this is literally how the rally committee would put together those absolutely glorious card stunts that you would see at the old Coliseum or at the Rose Bowl. Um, in the photograph, you can see the rally committee from 1958 hard at work. And while I can't guarantee you this is the stunt that they were working on, this is one of the card stunts from 1958. You can see how elaborate it is, how many cards they had to create and stamp and double check just for one stunt. But that actually happens to be one of our signature stunts. That is the UCLA in script which happened throughout in, in every single one of our card stunts. I also hope that our, on the, uh, our alumna on the call are uh, proud of the fact that in this world of card stunts, we are innovators. We started doing them in 1923, so even before we came to Westwood. We were the first school to do light stunts in 1935, and that's that's where you either had a uh, you usually had a transparent uh, card that was a different color that you showed a uh, flashlight through. And then later on, we got really fancy and we had multiple colors on one sheet that you could shine your uh, flashlight through. And that was in 1935 that we did that. And then later on in the 40s, we got really fancy with animated and 3D stunts here at UCLA. Another thing that is hugely important in the life of our students, and I'm glad to let you all know, is still occurring today as we are not all able to be on campus, is the huge important role that student groups have in creating community for our students. However, that does pose a bit of a challenge for me as the university archivist, because there's one of me and we have over 1000 registered student groups. So I am sorely outnumbered in my work. However, one of the groups that I've been able to work with very closely is Samahang Pilipino. That is the Philippine American student group that was formed in 1972. I'm proud to say that this, uh, these groups of students every year have a deep appreciation for their history and their archives. They come and look at it every year. And so this year we're going to try and find a way that we can do this for them virtually because they and their alumni take their role in part of the uh, UCLA's history very seriously. And this actually on, on the screen here, you can see uh, their recognition from their 25th anniversary of their founding. And I also have in the archives recognition from the city of Los Angeles for the 45th anniversary of their founding. One of the things that is the most important for me as an archivist is the deep knowledge that I have that archives, while they have the power to teach, they also have the power to move. And this is a story of the things that you find when you're looking for something else. I was working on a completely different project. It wasn't even related to the university archives. And I was reviewing materials in one of the collections that we hold, which, is, which come from the Manzanar War Relocation Authority records. And I was flipping through the records very quickly, as you do when they're in a folder. And um, this caught my eye, this phrase here, UCLA, 1941. And I knew what was in the folder was, was correspondence from individuals who were at that time incarcerated in, in Manzanar. 
And it was related to an event that had happened at the camp where um, there was a fight between different um, groups that were there at, um, that were there and incarcerated. And it was, it's the most moving and eloquent advocacy for the Japanese American position at that time. And it is as you would expect from a recent graduate of UCLA. If you, if you, the day, the uh, letter was written in 1942. So that letter was written less than uh, just a little bit over a year from when he had graduated from UCLA. And one of the, one of the letters that, or one of the uh, sentences in the letter, I, I think about again and again, and, and he says this, he says, again, referring to your statement, I must point out that the casualties were Americans. Most of the injured were Americans. He was very adamant when arguing with the administration of the camp to remind them that they were incarcerating fellow Americans. And when I read that letter, the first thing I wanted to do was, was find him. So I, I found him in our yearbook and you can see a picture of him here. He was a phys he graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics. He was from Los Angeles. And, and to be quite honest, it's, I don't know whether I'll ever be able to do that, do it, but I would love to find one of his family members, if he had any family members, because I would love to share a copy of this letter so that they could see something that their relative wrote at such a harrowing and trying time, but yet he wrote with the full dignity and certainty of his right as an American to speak up for himself and everyone else who was there. Now, if my little talk today has whet your appetite for finding out more about UCLA and maybe finding more stories that you didn't know about, I'm encouraging you all to go to the UCLA Digital Library, which has not only all sorts of materials related to uh, the U UCLA, the university, but it has several other collections that are digitized for materials in special collections. And then if, if you really enjoyed the photographs of campus and people on campus, or if you're just kind of missing campus and you need that little UCLA fix, I really encourage you to go to one of our newest websites, Picturing UCLA, which has over 10,000 photographs from the university archives of photographs related to UCLA, its people and its events. And then hopefully, hopefully, in 2021, we will have two exhibits um, on campus that hopefully we'll be able to come and look at and see that will include materials from university archives. And I'd just like to close by saying that it's important to remember that we are all worthy of telling our stories and having them heard. And the most important thing that I can do as an archivist is to make sure that in one way or another, we can all see ourselves in the archives and recognize that you are a part of something larger than yourself. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Heather, I know that you don't hear the resounding applause that's taking place right now all over the place. I can't imagine where everybody's sitting, but they're all cheering. Talk about a UCLA fix. You gave us a main line. And I think we're really, really invigorated by what you said. 
and the way that this whole UCLA ecosystem is so important, both emotionally, intellectually, and, and identity. And I, I appreciate what you said, and I'm just so happy that you were able to share the story with us. Um, I would like to invite everyone to uh, click on the little button that says Q&A if you have a question, and I will be your surrogate speaker, and I will do my best to ask your question and make sure that uh, we plainly get an answer for you. I'm going to tell you right now that we're, I can see some questions popping up that, Heather, they're about to test your, um, your trivia here. So Ooh, the beautiful wow. thing about what Heather can do, though, is that she is, first and foremost, a librarian, and you can contact her, and she can follow up on your question and get you some of that uh, data that you need if it's a quantity or a number that you need to ask. So yes. uh, I'm going to... Start with the couple. I haven't memorized the whole 101 years <laughs> of UCLA <laughs> you really, history. You really should, Heather. I don't need to get on it. Okay. Uh, so a couple of things I just, there were some comments I just wanted to share with you that someone said that besides uh, UC Chino Hills, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe it would have been uh, someone saw Burbank, the Burbank website said that yeah. UCLA, Wendy, Wendy Lay said that the Burbank website. So, you know, we'd have to clap UC Burbank. <laughs> yeah, it's again, it's, you know, it's not gonna, we, we it's have, not to have the same rhythm. It doesn't quite have the same rhythm. But yes, no, you, you are absolutely right there. The, uh, the the plans for Burbank, there were there were over 100 proposals. And and some of them, some of them have these big, elaborate maps about come and put the university here. And, uh, but yes, it's, it's a fascinating collection and I look forward to uh, anybody who wants to come by and see it. Oh, wonderful. We can get it out. <laughs> yes. When we finally can come together Someday. again, health and healthily and safely. Um, also, Wendy shared with us that, um, that there is, uh, UCLA also has a loyalty oath, just so you oh, know. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It did. It did. But it ended its loyalty oath four years before um, Nina Byers was applying at the University of Washington. So gotcha. UCLA had ended its loyalty oath requirement well before Washington. And, um, and uh, now one thing I have not inquired about is I have not inquired of the University of Washington archivist as to when they did finally uh, end their loyalty oath but i tell you they missed out on a fantastic physicist but it's it's quite inspiring to read her letter about like no i cannot take this job i love that and i should i should correct myself i'm learning in real time i feel like i'm live on tv here <laughs> Uh, that Wendy is our student in the library and is brilliant, but she's passing on the brilliance of uh, a visitor named Laureen Lazarovici, who asked the first, who mentioned the first question about Bur Bur Burbank and Ava Khan, who talked about the oath. So I'm sorry about oh, that. Yes. So, oh, and so let's go to our first question. This is a, a, a trivia here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. How many movies would you guess have been filmed at UCLA? Numbers I could not say, but okay. I know that at least, gosh, in the in the nine years that I've worked here, there's there's probably been seven or eight. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to television programs and movies that include uh, UCLA. I have to watch them, even if they're really bad. I have <laughs> to watch them because I have to sort of like check, like, oh yes. That's UCLA. That is not Rome. You are not <laughs> in Rome. You are running through the back of Royce. So, <laughs> so, so I don't have a list on that, but you know, that's, that's a good one. So I couldn't say. Well, best pet like, pet like you should feel free to email Heather and ask her to check on that count. Yeah, I can check on that. Number. I can and, check um, on that. Bess also asks, how are the card stunts done as of late because of um, prior to COVID? Before COVID happened, how are the card stunts done now? Or uh, in a well, previous now? Yeah, the uh, previous to now. So um, in talking with some of our more recent graduates and our recent students, the, the, the card stunts have in most cases gone away unfortunately. And, and when they were there, they were much smaller. I mean, at one point we were, um, 
uh, getting the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest card stunts. If you look at the um, the diagram that I had up, it was it was about thirty five people across and forty five rows up. So Whoa. they were they were enormous. And 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 um, uh, one of the things that I have is I have a lot of photographs along with those, and you can see basically what if it was the daytime people would sit sort of like right in front of their face. And you, the one thing is, is you could not go anywhere during halftime because these occurred during halftime. So you were not going to the concession to get um, a hot dog or anything. So you were holding these cards and it was a synchronized thing. There was somebody on, there was the Yell King on the uh, field who were yelling out and you would flip the cards and you were holding them right here. And it was, it was a wonder. I, uh, it still, was an absolute analog then, right? It still oh, feels like it's, it's, it's com it was completely, ag it was completely analog, except when we got really fancy with the um, flashlights. So and, now we're getting uh, a little more te technologically advanced. Yes, in, in the thirties. But uh, the marvelous thing is, is that we have lots of film footage of these, both daytime stunts and nighttime stunts. So even though we don't do them very much anymore and, and we haven't done them with such verve in quite a while, most many of them have been uh, documented over the years in color. The night stunts are, the night stunts are a little bit hard to see in yeah. film, but you yeah. can, if the if the picture is clear enough, you can you can see it, and they really are gorgeous. <laughs> well, Heather, from 1969 to 1973, one of our one of our visitors today named Catherine Cleary said she participated in the card stunts, and it was really fun. And it's she's probably very excited that you're mentioning it. And so uh, we have a veteran stunter in Yay! the room, everyone. Just so you know. And so oh, that's great. I, I put my uh, glasses on so I could read names better. better. <laughs> Catherine also has a question, and, and I think it kind of comes together with uh, Albert, Alberto Perez's question, which asks, um, he asks, is there a private collection at UCLA? And also, how are decisions made about what is included in the archives? And I wondered if you could tease out an answer to both of those, the fact that we're like accessible and open, and mm -hmm. also how you make decisions. Yes, oh, absolutely. So, um, the, uh, for, for the university archives, so I'm going to start first by talking about the university archives, and then I will broaden it out to a broader picture. In the university archives, what, what goes into university archives is first uh, those records that have been deemed by um, the UC, so the system-wide records retention schedule. That's what um, the... Uh, entire UC system has decided are going to be the official records of the system. And that's how, you know, I get things like the chancellor's records and how there are certain things like the, the final annual budget. And so sometimes those are not the most exciting records you've ever heard of, but, but it, they, but the information in them, the story, the story is exciting, even if they don't look that exciting. When it comes to materials that come from student groups or other groups, those are those, while those aren't uh, considered official records, they are part of the university's history. And in the, uh, in the, I don't know, the edict that comes <laughs> down from the office of the president. So the, so, so the, here's, the, here's a fun fact that I didn't mention. The university archivist position, there is one on every UC campus. Oh. And the authority is the, the office of the president delegates authority to the chancellor who de delegates authority to the university librarian to hire someone to run the university archive. So, so, so that, so, so when I get into that position, part of that delegation of authority along with the official records of the university is this sort of more amorphous thing that talks about documenting the history, the people, activities, 
and decisions of the university. And so that's where the student group materials come in. But in those cases, those student groups are, are not, uh, they, they are, uh, I guess, more like private individuals than say mm -hmm. like, so, so if you're the Dean of uh, Humanities, your records, uh, your official records that are permanent have to come to the university archives. If you're the current president of Samahang Pilipino, you do not have to give me your records. I have to um, persuade you and work <laughs> with you um, and show you how this might benefit both you and the history of the university to document that larger, uh, that larger history. So I, I sort of collect in two different areas from the people who have to give me things and the people who I have to cultivate and encourage them to give me materials. And then, so as far as like what is accessible in the records retention schedule, there are certain records that are um, noted as confidential for a certain number of years. And that usually has to do with various federal laws or state laws regarding individual personal privacy because there's social security numbers and mm -hmm. things like that in it. And, and when it comes to um, records from uh, private individuals or student groups and all that, those are given to us. Um, and, and in some cases, people do say that for a period of time, I would, I want the collection to come to UCLA because it's going to be open to the public because you don't give us papers unless you want people to do research in them mm -hmm. because that's what we do. But they may have uh, a certain amount of material. So for example, Samahong does not want me to make available to people without their permission, any of their membership lists. They want sense. to keep their membership list confidential, but make it available to other Samahang members. And but there is but there's always a mechanism by which we can open up materials. So private individuals do have ability when they are donating uh, materials to discuss with us ways in which they might um, limit access for a very limited period of time because we do that, you know, normally because of their own personal privacy concerns. But by and large, when people are donating materials or when I am um, working with somebody and trying to persuade them to donate materials to me, I'm always explaining that, you know, to my view, it's an added benefit to give your records to a public institution because you don't have to have a reason. You do not have to be a scholar. You do not have to be affiliated with UCLA or be a citizen of the state. Or mm. You can just want to learn something new. You can just be curious and use library special collections at UCLA libraries. So. That's a great, great answer. <laughs> and they're coming in as you're, as you're answering. Um, I'm going to go in order while they're asked to make sure I honor everybody's uh, questions here. So Heather, can you just give us a brief sense of some of the photos and the files from the Daily Bruin? Oh, oh, this is this is marvelous because um, for the most part, the Daily Bruin keeps their own archive. And so so what I have, what I have right now from the Daily Bruin is um, we have microfilmed all of the issues of the Daily Bruin, also the Cub Californian and the normal daily. I always get the exponent was the Los Angeles State Normal School yearbook. And I always forget. And I was I was looking at it uh, yesterday and I forget the title of it, but we have them all. We have them all microfilmed and they are currently available online. You and, and they are full text searchable. So um, if you want to, if you want to look at those, let me know. I can hook you up. Even in this distance time when I have no access to collections, I can get you the Daily Bruin. Wonderful. And, 
<laughs> and, and, but the, one of the things that I am right now working on is Tell that me. in more recent years, the students who are on the Daily Bruin, they've been keeping their own photographs because historically the Daily Bruin kept an ASUCLA kept all their own photographs and um, keep that collection um, for their own uses. And lately students have been keeping their own archives. And so I've been working with students who worked in the Daily Bruin in the 90s to um, uh, work on help uh, finding if I can get some of their photographs to be able to add that to that larger photographic archive. So, uh, so yes, you're watch doing that a space. lot of connecting of, of, of the decades there. Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what you do. Uh, so I want to shift a little bit and, uh, but, but Harold Bronson, you can go online and email Heather if you can't find those Daily Bruin images, I'm sure that she can connect you. I, I can, I can hook you up. <laughs> Laureen Lazarovici asks, um, how do you deal with items that are born digital as opposed to on paper? Like the email from today that you mentioned, mm -hmm. what are the archives going to be like in the future? People use paper less, right? Well, they do and they don't. You would mm -hmm. be surprised <laughs> how much paper I still find in offices that I still collect and I still, I still bring in the archive. So, so paper has the, the uh, paper's not dead yet, but you are right. Most, a lot of the things that we are creating today in, in everything, whether it be audio, video, photographs, emails, um, Word documents, they are electronic. And when you are preserving electron, a born digital material, you want to keep it in the format that it started in to the extent possible. And I am very fortunate to have a colleague, Shira Peltzman, who is our digital archivist. A genius. Who I, who, yeah, <laughs> who I work with because she has been able to set us up a system where I can, uh, so for example, what I would do if I was on campus is I would be going out to the individual offices and meeting with them and talking with them about um, managing their email and what of their uh, born digital materials is actually archival because not everything that everybody collects gets to come in the university archives. That's, that's always one oh, of the yeah. things I'm like, I your work that. is incredibly important. We just don't have the space. We just don't <laughs> we have can't the get space. it all. Yeah. We can't get it all. And so, uh, so I work with them to bring things in. So, so actually what I am doing now, I mean, it's not very sophisticated because I do not have the access to our fancy setup that is in YRL. So what I've been doing lately is I've been saving things to box and mm. to our network server so that because the main thing right now with anything born digital is that you lots of copies keep stuff safe. And the more your copies are networked rather than sitting on various media, the better off the, or the better chance you have of making those bits and bytes last longer. So that is, so that is what I did with the email today because the email today was about um, how during the holidays I should comport myself as a member of the UCLA committee, community that does occasionally come to campus and so that I don't get COVID-19. Mm, and so because smart. that is an official uh, letter that went out, I wanted to make sure that we saved it. Wonderful. <laughs> Heather, you mentioned work that there are a thousand student groups and you're one person, and I know you probably do a lot of work with them, but Brianna is wondering, you know, what, what led you to work so closely with the Filipino students as opposed to say other student groups, I'm sure you work with others. And then she was uh, curious, uh, Brianna was curious about what the project might have been that, that spawned that really strong relationship you have. Oh, well, one of the, I mean, uh, I'm just lucky. I've said that. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say, I'm just lucky. Um, well, first, uh, first and foremost, um, I do, I work with, I, I reach out to lots and lots of student groups. I don't always hear back, but I reach out to, a, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of, you know, virtual cold calling and cold emailing about like, hi, 
I'm the university archivist. <laughs> uh, but in this case, one of the things is that um, the Samahang Pilipino collection had actually started in the university archives back in the 90s. Huh. And, um, and it had uh, started in the 90s and it was, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a fairly decent sized collection. And then I want to say in about 2015, so it had, uh, it had laid, uh, it would, it, there'd been, it'd been quiet for a while, we'll say. And in 2015, they have, uh, a lot of the student groups have historians and, and the current historian and the historian that had just been elected for the group, um, you know, they, 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 it was one of those things where they had heard from one of their alumni that, hey, you know, we got an archive. We got an archive. It's in the university archives. You should go talk to them. And, and their first impetus was because they had a whole bunch of material in their office in Kirkhoff. And they wanted to get it out of the office in Kirkhoff. Uh -huh. And so they came to me and, and it was honestly, it's, it's a wonderful story because um, the incoming historian who helped bring the materials over from Kirkhoff um, really honestly caught the archive bug and the history bug. And he, 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 he decided that what he wanted to do was have an opportunity for all of the current and new members of Samahang to come and look at their history. So he created these little open houses that I would help mm. him host. And, and what that has spawned over basically these last five years is every, every year I get a, a really engaged historian who, and in fact, even this year, uh, remotely, I have a deeply engaged historian. And what happens is, is that they're continuing to donate materials. They are continuing to have these outreach. They have little projects that they do with the collection. And they're just super engaged. They're, I, I, I do have to admit, I'm like, you too could be like some hung Filipino. You know? Yeah, they're a and, model. Um, student group for sure and, and I do I have I have other I have other groups that I work with but they are by far they they love their history and I love people who love history so that's wonderful. it works for me <laughs> that's wonderful Edson Smith asks does the university archivist have an Instagram presence he Edson would love to see visual tidbits from UCLA history on a regular basis so uh I I don't know if you want to speak to some of the broader goals we have for the UCLA library, uh, having a collective presence, right? And so maybe I can, can talk certainly a about do that. that. Sure. I uh -huh. can certainly do that. I was going to say that um, the UCLA's, um, the University Archives um, frequently participates in the Instagram of both the UCLA library and currently the library special collections, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all that. But one of the things that is happening either right now, or I think, I think in 2021, I'm not sure on the timing is that one of the great things is, is that we're going to have less places for you to go look on, uh, on the uh, socials. And there's going to be one UCLA account, but that we can all contribute to. So, and, and one of the things that I find, because I follow them all, if it's related to UCLA, I'm following you on Instagram. And one of the things that I find is that our, uh, the photographs that are in, uh, from UCLA or about UCLA are now being used by all sorts of different channels, current social channels within the library. So I have a feeling that when we are con in, uh, just a few channels as the voice of the library, you're going to see me around a lot. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a great answer. And let's move on to uh, Alva Stevenson. Hi, Heather. Hi, Say hello Alva. To Alva. <laughs> Do you have local, state, or federal government ever reached, researched in the university archives in connection, say, with proposed legislation? Hmm. Now that is not what they have not done that. 
since since I have been university archivist and I've been university archivist since uh, July of 2014. So I have not I've I've not been aware in advance of somebody doing research in our collections. I mean, every now and again, I get a lot of questions about like, what are the leases on this part of land? I get lots of questions mm -hmm. about what land we own, what land we lease. And I, I do a lot of research Wonderful. on those, but I haven't seen anything in the university archives in regards to uh, policies and procedures. But also one of the things is, is you don't have to tell us why you're there and what you're doing. Yep. So it's very private. So we probably, we very possibly could have had somebody yep. doing exactly that kind of research and not know. And that's yes. okay. We definitely like to protect our users and their privacy when they come into our collections, but we do have some aggregate information about some questions that we often ask. Um, this is what would come about from a, re a response that Heather would have. She would, what you just said, you know, there might be some questions, but, and these are some of what the types of questions are about leases and things like that. Mm -hmm. And and Heather, most of the questions, in fact, that I answer, um, uh, aren't always from the general public. I mean, to be quite honest, as I like to say, my largest user is the campus yep. because a lot of times the campus, the campus does not remember everything that it has done. And so a lot of times I am contacted by departments and offices and individuals on campus trying to find out if something, if I have any documentation or if I have any information on decisions we made or choices we made or maybe what the things we didn't choose, what were they about? So. I do Wonderful. And we're as we're approaching the five minute warning, we're not there yet. I just want to let everybody in the audience know that your questions are wonderful and our colleagues are going to be collecting them for Heather to uh, maybe reach back out or work through um, the people who have registered and make sure we get some of your answers, uh, just like we would any reference question. And here's a good one for you from Ray Sinisak. Can you talk about the history of ROTC or ROTC on campus? I can. I can. I not not in great depth. Not in great depth. I have to. I have to. And and, and unfortunately, I currently don't have access to those collections. But I, I will say that I have worked with them, not not in the last year or so, but I have worked with them several times um, in regards to materials that uh, were there still on site, like photographs and scrapbooks that they still had. But the most work that I did with it was a few years ago. Um, some of you may have seen an exhibit that I did in uh, the Powell library on Arthur Ashe. And if you came to the exhibit, you know this, but if you didn't come to the exhibit, I won't, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you. Our, uh, Arthur Ashe was a member of the ROTC while on campus. I mean, part of the, uh, part of uh, ROTC was at the time that he was here, uh, um, a healthy male student, you had to be in the ROTC. And so um, I worked through our materials and did research in our materials in order to create that exhibit. But, but yes, I have to, I, I, the, 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 uh, the commandant that runs that, they, they change pretty often. So I always have to go back and reestablish that, that relationship. That, I mean, that is one of the things, honestly, that I spend the most time doing is developing relationships and renewing relationships and creating new relationships with people on campus. Because if the people on campus do not give me the records, I don't have anything. And I can attest to your wonderful relationship building. Everybody knows who you are, and they're always happy to see you when you're showing up representing the university story. I hope they're happy to they're see very me. Happy. I'm always happy to see you too. So Eddie Cole asked the question, do you know how early or late UCLA was in launching an African study, American studies program, like the Bunch Letter, for example, compared to other large majority white universities. Do you know where we situate in mm -hmm. that timeline? Mm -hmm. um, for uh, for African studies, we were Sorry, African one, studies yes. for mm -hmm. African studies. We were one of the earliest. We were one of the earliest and especially for um, large 
white majority white public institutions because because we were also one of the earliest ones that uh, got Title VI funding from the federal from the federal government. So um, I believe there there were probably earlier um, uh, uh, African studies programs or you know majors at some of the East Coast schools, especially some of the private East Coast schools, but um, the I think there might have been a few more. But we were we were one of the earlier we were one of the earlier ones, and and that was actually I learned that doing research for another exhibit because I did an exhibit at the uh, to celebrate the fiftieth anniversary of the. Uh, ethnic studies centers mm. and and the 50th and 60th anniversaries of the first four international studies centers which were the African Studies Center, the Latin American Institute, the Near Eastern uh, Near Eastern Studies Center, and the um, Russian and Eastern European Studies Center. And those were our first four. And of those two, the second one was the African Studies Center. <laughs> Wonderful. There are so many questions here, Heather, and I know that we're capturing them and everybody knows your name and they're gonna reach out. So I'm gonna ask- And I'm last. the only one. So you, you look, I, just, I mean, you I can can't hide. Google yes. University Archivist at UCLA and you will find Heather's smiling face. And I just wanted to give you one final question before we say our goodbye and our thanks. And this is from Chancellor Emeritus Young. And he's oh. asking, if I want to write a book about my tenure, can you help me with my archive? And maybe we can expand that about people who have written books out of, out of, out of university archives. Yes, yes. Well, and yes, I can. And it's, it's a little bit hard right now because I actually am not on campus and don't have access to the materials. So, it's the, so we, we'd have to use virtual sources and digital sources at the moment. But, uh, but uh, yes, I do that frequently with all sorts of researchers. Uh, what I do is I can I can help and sit down and find out what it is, what what whether it's your entire time, which is a very long time at UCLA, <laughs> uh, or or just a particular aspect of it. And what I do is I help researchers identify where the information and where the documentation that they might need might be in the university archives. And one of the things that I find and that I tell departments and researchers quite a lot is that let me help you with your research because in many ways I have access and can find things across the entirety of the university archives. So while there may be, and I know there are a lot of really interesting information in the chancellor's records, there's also records in things like the academic senate and there's records in student groups. And, and in, in a lot of cases, it, it is a bit of a hunt because the information is not where you'd expect it to be. But that's what I do for researchers is I, I take what they want to know and then work to find, well, where it, who would have written about that? What part of the university would have dealt with that? And did they keep any papers? And do I have them? And, and sometimes I have to try a couple of different avenues, but we usually find some. Oh, Heather finds it. <laughs> if it's there, she'll find it. And I just want to, before I do my official thanks, there are some important people that Heather and I wish to thank, or the people that helped put this together, our guides, Julie Altieri, our, our colleagues in development and in communications, and our uh, university librarian Jenny Steele and our uh, distinctive collections to uh, lead Sharon Farb. So there are so many players involved in, in this event for all of you. So I hope you enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. Heather and I don't get enough time together. So this was fun for us to, to be together. And I just wish to thank everyone. And I'm going to close with the, uh, some remarks from someone who just chatted us and said, Heather, we love your energy. It was a great program and thank you. And I can't at all say more because that is exactly what this was, a great program. We have your questions. We're good librarians. We'll get back to you. And um, please, please keep on the lookout for future programs like this and let us know what you thought about this one when you hear from some of our colleagues. 
Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.